All right. So now on to topic models. Oh, the dog is licking my leg for reasons I don't understand. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So last week we did latent semantic analysis. This week we're going to compare and contrast and do the more popular sort of topics models. And so what I want to do is expand semantic vector space models into topics models, talk about the types of relationships that things can have, um, and kind of like get into a little bit more how these models are sort of theoretically supposed to capture things and then how practically we can use them. Okay. And then how to differentiate the different, like what's the difference between an LSA, a Coles, and a topics model, that kind of thing. So, with late semantic analysis, the idea was to sort of build a mental picture or a you know, mathematical picture of a set of documents, right, and then see if some other thing matched those documents or how, what the relationship between words was, that kind of idea. So we created these dimensions and then examined, um, you know, the dimensions by mostly dimensions by words, but we could do dimensions by documents too. Okay. But topics models approaches this idea from a slightly different perspective in that it's like, well, okay, well, there are words and people are reading words. So what does it take for us to understand what is happening? Okay. And so this is based on a kind of famous model from Kinch where the first step really is to like, what is this concept? So these concepts, the words themselves are important because we have to pull them from memory and pull up their sort of definition from our mental lexicon. And that's a dynamic process that is based on the information that's coming in. So as we're reading, we're changing our perception dynamically. And the piece of background information that we'll retrieve from, from memory will depend on the previous pieces read. And that's the idea. We'll take this context and build it into a gist. So gist representation means we lose the individual words, so we should, maybe shouldn't focus so much on words. Instead, create these um, kind of mental models, little mini movies, if you will, of text. And um, much like a lot of the things that we talked about with priming, right? we think that people are better at at understanding reading and listening. So it's not just reading. I use reading as an example because we're generally talking about text documents that you have to read, right? But this could be watching a movie. This could be um, listening to your friend tell a story, that kind of stuff. So uh, any type of process that requires us to cognitively pull things from memory is improved by guessing what comes next, right? So that's one of the reasons we think priming happens is people are sort of dynamically trying to um, predict what's next. Sometimes it's called expectancy generation, where we are reading along, we have an expectation of what's next. Okay. And that is one reason why so many places use clickbait titles. As we have this natural propensity, you won't believe what happened. Then, you know, you won't believe that. And so they leave these ambiguous phrase structures so that you're compelled to open it to figure out what the end of that phrase structure should be. So you have this expectation of like, okay, they're going to tell me what happened and then they don't, right? Because they're trying to get you to open it. So uh, we'll go back to the bank example, but bank might prime federal reserve like money, bank, cash, checks, getting paid. Um, but bank has multiple senses as we've talked about before. So anytime you hit the word bank, you're probably going to start with its most likely definition. And then based on the evolving context of the other words, you'll change what your guess is. And so GIST representation allows us to create this idea of topic to disambiguate sense. Now, in an LSA model, this is not unplausible. Like a model still works for this idea. Um, but topics models start from this idea that there are, there are these, these overarching themes or topics that allow us to know what to pull from memory. And so this really builds on a lot of category representation, which we've talked about all year. Um, where if I told you that the 
topic or the theme was about washing clothes, then a sentence like, make sure you separate them, or it could be a costly mistake, makes a lot of sense, right? Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, you guys know I have dogs. I could have said, you know, the theme is keeping the peace, right? make sure you separate them, or it could be a costly mistake. Totally different interpretation, okay? Um, so understanding topic is important for understanding how people read and create many movies of of text. So there's kind of four ways to think about how we do this, right? Obviously the words are important. So words have a linked concept. Okay? So words refer to some sort of concept. So when people say word, they mean the printed thing on the page or the physical sound. Concept refers to more of its um, definition, its kind of picture. So when I say dog, it refers to, you know, a beagle under my feet. But then there's these concept-concept relationships. So um, um, word itself is sort of dis is is ambiguous. It could mean lots of different things. Concept is the situated knowledge, our understanding of what that um, meaning is. And concepts have relationships. So when I say bank and money, that concept, you know, the, the interpretation of that um, and its relationship to each other. So the dog is a type of animal. Is another example. Okay. And then the concept actions. So knowledge about what um, concepts do or act or are used for. So like the concept of a knife being a cutting utensil. And then we also have word word knowledge, our understanding of how words just generally can co-occur, like peanut butter. Right? So that is word word that builds into one concept. And uh, I feel like I don't have too many overlapping lectures. But this picture is a representation of these differences between models. Sorry, I'm trying to move the Adobe Connect window out of the way here. There we go. And so the, the left-hand side here is a kind of a representation of that um, Collins and Loftus, yes, Collins and Loftus model that we talked about m many weeks ago now. But it also kind of also represents the network model that we're going to do next week. And so there's this idea that, that um, Words themselves are represented by these bubbles or these nodes, and the relationship between words building into concepts, right, is the lines between them, sometimes called edges. And so we can assign numbers to those, and we'll talk about how to do that next week. Uh, B here in the middle is the representation of an LSA projected into two dimensional space. So this would be the, you know, we've crunched it down with singular vec uh, value decomposition. I'm still doing it wrong. SVD, <laughs> and we take those first two dimensions and we look at how the words, um, the different senses of the word bank kind of cluster together. So we've got money up here, we've got river down here, and then oil over here. And so um, that is a way that we kind of representing those themes, and sometimes these themes kind of overlap, right? So stream commercial deposits, like those can kind of overlap a little bit. Um, I would have thought commercial would have come down a little bit more towards oil, but you know, um, this is the, the space for those texts, because remember the text space, cha the changes based on the text you have. And the last one over here is a topics model. So in topics models, um, the idea is that we get these words by dimension matrices. And instead of having like a, a projection of them into space, like where we create those nearest neighbors plots, we have just the, the probability of each word representing each dimension. And so that's a kind of a very different concept than B, where B is the, the, the weight, the sort of regression weight of that word to that dimension. So you can think about how strongly it relates to that dimension. Um, that's not a bad interpretation. But the goal is to like picture a high dimensional space. Well, with topics, um, the goal really is a reduction in space to build a, a model that has usually a few number of topics because it's often used as an unsupervised classification scheme. And we're just looking at the likelihood of each document in a topic 
or the likelihood of each word to, or like kind of the, the strength of each word to the topics. Okay. So, you know, practically, they're very similar, mathematically a little different, but their use case, what people use them for, is pretty different. All right, maybe, moving on, yes. So, um, there are just different ways to think about semantic memory. So like I think about everything as a giant network of interconnected nodes. That best kind of represents kind of a picture of what the brain is doing with all the little neurons. And that theme, the gist, arises from what nodes are on. I can think about LSA being that the themes rep are represented in the dimensions, right? And how those dimensions um, uh, overlap or how they interact with each other, so where words are placed on those dimensions. For those topics, the themes, the sort of gist of knowledge, arises from the weight of each word on each topic and that interpretation of what those words represent. Because um, they're not always as pretty and as clean as the um, pictures. Right? Uh, so it's essentially three different ways to think about how what happens when people are reading. And that's, that seems like sort of this big, broad question that maybe like in your business day-to-day -day job you wouldn't think about very much. But practically it's very important because if we can think about what people do when they read, right, we can make sure that they understand what we're trying to portray. So let's say you're writing um, a manual or frequently asked questions. You want those to be as clear as possible. Um, and then, uh, especially too, if we start to think about second language speakers, like many of you are, um, or um, people who are speaking multiple languages, like what is the best way to kind of disambiguate things? Okay. Um, and English is a particularly poor language with this. It is, um, what's the joke? Uh, three languages in a trench coat pretending to be one language. <laughs> so um, English is especially ambiguous. So understanding how people process it would, helps us out. And what we think people do is they translate words into their concepts, their, their picture of the world, and by pulling in background knowledge from other related concepts. And you sort of, if you ever stop and listen to yourself talk about your favorite TV show, your favorite book, podcast, whatever, and you relate it to something else, you know, I really like this, um, I really like The Bachelor because it's similar to, I don't know what, um, it has the same ridiculousness as, as Big Brother or something like that, right? Um, by doing those relationships that you're doing this process, right? You're using that background knowledge to, to pull concepts. We also use word co-occurrence to help us predict the next word. This is like a Markov chain model. We do this in our head, right? So given my experience with the world and the, the language, I'm going to predict what word comes next based on what I've previously heard. And by doing both of those, we can generate what we expect to have coming next because we know what the situation is. So a topics model suggests that people are predicting the next word because it helps us understand, like given what topic we think is occurring, we're predicting what's coming next because that just helps us process and we don't like to think very hard as people. Okay. I'm gonna teach this as like cognitive psych for like undergrads. Um, there's like two rules. We like new and exciting things, brain-wise, and we don't like to think very hard. <laughs> and so having that prediction of what comes next helps us with the don't think very hard part. Okay. It helps us disambiguate, understand um, the sense or the meaning, which version of the word we're using. And it builds into this gist representation. So we like things that have these nice, neat pictures, okay, or they end with these nice, neat pictures. So if you've ever read like murder mysteries or any kind of mystery novel, it, it's ambiguous for a long time, right? But it, if it resolves nicely at the end, people like them. And then you can read novels where they don't resolve and people hate the books, right? Or they, they, they talk about this. I hated it because it never answered this question. Right? And that's where the gist comes in. We like things to be tied up in little bows. Okay? So we forget the individual words and remember the picture of the data. Now mathematically, here's how they're different. So LSA is on the top, topics is on the bottom. 
So LSA um, starts by being a words by documents matrix, so does topics, but the internal components are some sort of bag of words model with usually some sort of sparsity correction applied. So we did um, log frequency times inverse document frequency. Um, often there's term uh, TF IDF or term frequency inverse document frequency transform. That's not quite what we did, but we did something like that. So that's what they mean by transform. It's usually not raw word counts because of the sparsity problem. Topics models actually start with a probability distribution, which is the correction on um, sparsity for that one. It's probab <laughs> a probability distribution has a known bounds, right? Zero to one. Okay. Still have a lot of really small numbers, but it's, it solves this heavy skew problem. Now, uh, then LSA through SVD um, is transformed into this words by dimension. So when we were doing plot neighbors and doing calculating cosines, this is the one we got with, got. And then a documents by dimensions where I could take that document, my student's text, and compare it to a model, right? So I would take um, a new document and compare it to the dimensionality of all the other documents. So we don't tend to work with the dimensions by dimensions matrix, but it exists. Um, topics models have several different mathematical pieces. Most common one is LDA, um, but you can do others. And what you end up with, very cleanly, personally, is a words by topics matrix where the internal number, instead of being some pie in the sky weight, like some, some number that's a weight that might be positive, might be negative, it's not really clear what that number means, is a probability. Right? It's the likelihood of that word being associated with that topic. And then you also end up with a topics by documents dimension, which is the likelihood of that topic in that document. That is very nicely interpretable. And it's not like LSA's words by dimensions is not. It's just the appeal of these probabilities um, is pretty nice. So what can I use topics for that isn't like theoretical stuff, right? So it allows us to reveal topics. So I feel like this is a really great start for understanding what your documents have. Right? If the um, text is very messy, which it easily could be, then you can reveal that you have a lot of different types of text. But let's say you're taking your support tickets and trying to classify them into groups. This could reveal like what are the most common themes that you get in your support. Jira, whatever. And then I can use that to classify. So I can use this as an unsupervised algorithm because I don't necessarily have the answer. Although if you had the answer, you could see if this model represents that answer well. Uh, so it's very similar to a clustering um, and it helps us find these sort of natural groups and corpus. But to me, this model has the advantage over many of these other unsupervised tasks is that it um, the words by topics matrix provides a clear view into what is doing the classification. So often with these machine learning algorithms, we end up with these answers, this sort of um, topics by documents matrix, but we don't have a good reason why it happened. I can't explain to you why the classification worked because I just put it through SVM or something. Um, but in this case, the topics model has a very clear answer. Like, here is what is driving that topic. So a little bit of math here. I one day will look up how to pronounce this correctly, but I'm going to go with Leighton Dirichlet. An allocation, or LDA, is the most popular mathematical transform to create those two matrices. And the idea behind LDA, although we, I'll show you two other ones, is that every document is a mix of different topics. Uh, even if you tried, generally documents include multiple topics, unless they're very short. And every topic is built from a mix of words. And that just makes sense, because there are um, multiple pieces that build into that concept, that just representation. And this beautifully allows things to overlap. 
So often when we're doing these classification scenarios, we we're trying to force things into one thing or another, and language doesn't totally work that way. Right? A lot of these things overlap. And so by creating these probability distributions, we're capturing that variability, those sort of fuzzy boundaries, where one document might be 35% sports and 37% mechanics because we're talking about NASCAR. Right? Um, although there aren't a whole lot of sports this year, which makes me very unhappy because I live for sports. But um, it's that idea that there are things that overlap, right? I can have something that's cars and sports, depending on how you feel about NASCAR. I don't particularly love NASCAR, but it's a good example for that topic. Yeah. Um, and then LDA, why do people like LDA? I have that as the middle group. What I mean is that it mathematically tends to build a good model that allows us to find the words for each topic and the topics for each document. So some other of the math models don't have um, quite as desirable qualities as LDA provides us. You'll see that in a minute. So uh, the main package we're gonna use for R it's going to be topics models, but I also have, uh, loaded some tidy text because um, I'm going to show you kind of some examples from Julia Silja's book. Um, and while we're on that topic of topics, I will say that the um, use R um, conference, since like nothing is happening right now is uh, totally free and can be posted online um, since many of you like R and they have some really great tutorials that they're going to be posting that they normally would have in person at the conference and all this is going to be free this year which is really amazing and so like if you really like the stuff that I'm talking about um, you really should check out Julia's predictive model with text using tidy data principles I'm not a huge tidy person and I'm super excited about this talk. So um, FYI, and they've got some other cool stuff. Um, and then the keynote speakers also um, look really good. Like uh, agenda is where you can find when um, these are gonna be live, live shown, and then um, the other ones, that, and then recorded and put on YouTube. So. One good thing this year, I guess, <laughs> is that um, this is all free. So if you like this stuff, I would recommend watching that. All right, so I'm gonna load the data set that we worked with last week. And so remember, these are my students' answers on a test that was about attention and um, cognitive processing. I'm gonna create a corpus in the exact same way because I have one line. I have this in a kind of a fake data frame since it only has one column, but I have one uh, uh, text document per, per row. And so I can use vector source because you know that one column is a vector. You create that into a corpus. So this first step is the same. Just like uh, in the, the Python section, we could do the pretty much the same first step for LSA and topics. I'm gonna clean up the text. So we're gonna lowercase those words, take out that punctuation because we saw last week that's really bad. Um, remove the stop words. And this step will also, because we're gonna use TM, transform us into our words by document matrix. And so this time I just put it all into one giant step. The last time we um, did like TM map, you could do TM map again. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm trying to show you different ways in across weeks here. Um, so I can take this and put it into a document term matrix, right? Uh, so our corpus, and this is TM map. Okay. So I could have started with TM map first, but it's the same thing. Okay. So we're going to stem those words. We're going to take out stop words. We're going to say, hey, words need to be longer than two characters, which is generally true if you remove stop words. Most two character, um, words are stop words, in, of, that kind of stuff. I'm gonna take out numbers and remove punctuation. Okay, so I've done some big cleaning here. Now, 
In this particular section, what we're going to do is calculate that probability distribution and kind of um, pick deal with sparsity by picking a range of values that we're interested in. Okay, so we're going to control for the fact that not all words in every document and not word, you know, some words are more frequent than others, which is the sparsity problem. But what we'll do is we'll essentially ignore things that kind of have these zero frequencies or very, very low frequencies. And then actually we're going to ignore very frequent words. Um, so we're going to kind of, well, we could ignore very frequent words. In this example, we're going to kind of cut off the bottom. But there's um, kind of a lot of ways to do this. But this thing here, this giant T applied, which looks really scary, is essentially um, the probability distribution, but check out that it does normalize using log, just like we did last week, just different, slightly different form, and um, essentially calculates that weighted probability matrix. And that weighted probability matrix is what we're going to use to kind of reduce, um, reduce the data. And uh, brain fart is what's going to happen right now. Why would we do this? Well, this step here is to really just find a place at which we want to kind of control what's coming into the data frame. And so I'm actually going to, it says ignore very frequent and zero terms, but in reality what's happening um, is we're Look, looking here, so rows, this first spot's rows, this spot's columns. Okay. So we're only going to take documents. Um, wait, this is a document by term matrix. Hold on. Documents by terms. So this first one here, we're only going to take terms that are, are occurring at a weight of 0.1. Okay. Um, so this is documents by terms, and remember this is rows by columns, so we're talking about terms. And so this first one here essentially cuts off the like a minimum frequency, so the minimum number of times that a term has to occur across, uh, you know, across the stuff to be included. Okay. And um, that's really useful because essentially we're going to cut out a lot of these low frequency, low probability words. Now this number is not static. So when you're working on your own project, you should move this number up or down. Um, and so what I always tell people to do is to run run this line, because you can always undo it and rerun everything, right? Um, and look at the dimensions of the data to make sure that you haven't completely erased the data frame, essentially. Okay. So let's look at that practically real quick. Give that a second to load up. So my import mat, so I'm just going to use the dim function here, okay, is documents by terms. Okay, so we have 42 documents. That's my students' um, answers. I had 42 of them by 653 terms. And I can look at just a little bit of this so you can see oh, one to five, one to five, what's in it, right? And it won't actually even show me that. It'll show me like this matrix. This, and actually will tell you the sparsity of the matrix. So it's pretty high. Okay. Um, cool. So let's deal with that. So if I take my number here, my import nat, and change the weight here that has to have occur, let's look at the dimensions now. So I went from 653 terms to now 74 terms. Okay. I could decide if that is too big or too small. Okay. So let's go smaller. Okay, I will have to rerun everything, but that's okay. Um, so if I go smaller, sorry, dim import mat, now I have 300 terms. So essentially here we're cutting out the, the low, the low one. The second line, however, after you've cut out um, several, like let's say we've taken out here um, columns that were very infrequent, what we want to do is now take out 
uh, documents that are zero. Because okay. it could be, if I go back to my point 10 here, that when I eliminate some of the, uh, oh, <laughs> well, that's not good. I need that to be 74 here. There we go. Got excited with my tabbing. There we go. So it could be that now that I've eliminated some of those like 700, 600 columns, some of the documents are now zero because we've eliminated all the low frequency words that they had in them. Okay. So here what we want to do is just take out um, documents whose probability is zero. Okay. So let's see, did that eliminate any documents? Yes, three. So when we eliminated those words for being low frequency, um, we have now eliminated three documents that didn't have enough high frequency words. And that really can help kind of clear up and make your model a little bit cleaner. It's not necessarily required, but you'll see most people do some version of this weighting scheme where you take these um, matrices and you're trying to figure out like, Let's get rid of stuff that just is so infrequent to kind of help our topics converge because uh, a lot of low frequency stuff, um, noise can really make it difficult to interpret the, the final product. All right, so what we're actually doing here is picking frequent terms and then ignoring documents after we pick those frequent terms that have no longer have a, a likelihood of occurring. Okay. All right. So um, I, you know, I stole, stole this mostly from uh, several different places, and I don't really love the term definitions here. I need to reword these. Um, what we're going to do is look at alpha. Alpha is going to be our measure of topics, but alpha is not like a measure of topics in the sense of like it's going to tell you that there should be four topics, like a like factor analysis. Instead, it's kind of a measure of like the well-formedness. It's more of a silhouette type score, where a low score indicates that the to the document the topics are very cleanly separated. Okay, whereas a higher score represents kind of a more messy. There's lots of topics and lots of things going on. And if your goal is reduction, a high score will be bad. But you can use alpha to help you pick a model that has sort of the you know, minimum number of clear topics. Uh, beta here is, this is not the beta we're going to use. Beta here is a measure of the relatedness of a word to a topic. Okay. Um, just like beta would be thought of in regression. Okay. And so um, we're going to look at a different type of beta here. So I just need to update the notes. Um, gamma is an easy one. It's the probability of that topic in a document. Okay. So we'll pull out the beta matrix and it's, I would tell you to interpret it just like regression. The higher the score, the more related that word is to that topic. It's a probability instead of a beta weight, but it's kind of like a z-score. Okay. Gamma is the likelihood of um, each topic in each document. And then we can also calculate entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness. So like alpha, low scores mean lots of very structured topics. High scores mean a lot of kind of a disaster. Like there's a lot going on and it doesn't appear to be structured. I'll come right down. Update beta because that's the, there's a two different types of beta and we're going to use the weighted score version. So there are a couple of types of ways to do this practically in R, and then in Python we're just going to do this first one, which is called an LDA fit model. This is with the VEM, or Variational Expectation Maximization Algorithm, and it estimates alpha, a um, sort of measure of well-formedness. There's an LDA fixed model where it picks an alpha and fixes it. No matter you know how many different topics you have and all that kind of stuff. Uh, an LDA Gibbs model is a Bayesian version of an LDA fit model. And then completely different math is the correlated topics model, which really allows more for correlations between topics, and that also uses a VEM algorithm. 
I don't know that I see correlation topics models much outside of academia, right? I don't see like analytics people using it. I see most people using LDA fit. And you'll see why in a second. Um, so generally I would pick one model and just sort of stick with it. If you're gonna do that, pick the LDA fit model, but uh, we'll compare them now. And you do have to pick an expected number of topics. Obviously you can run these models again, Start with something small, work your way up. Okay, so I'm gonna start with three. I'm gonna set my seed here, just some random number. And then the functions in the topics model package are very easy. LDA, okay, our, our um, document by term matrix. And this is the one that we've kind of, you know, um, picked the weights, um, reduced the sparsity of. K for the number of doc topics and then our set seed, basically. If I want to do a fixed model, I do estimate alpha equals false. And then to do gives, we do method equals gives. Since this is a Bayesian algorithm, you have what's called a burn-in. This is the number of runs that you run that don't count to get it kind of the algorithm to settle. Um, the thinning is kind of taking out um, the number of chains that it's running and the number of times to iterate. Okay. I will tell you that this is very fast. Um, so it's a pretty efficient model unless you start going up into the super big numbers here. And the correlated topics model is CTM instead of the LDA, but it looks very similar, right? The general rule is put in the matrix, put in the number of topics and then some sort of control. This here is just um, a, a tolerance level. Okay, so if you've ever done any like uh, multi-level models, this is like a where it stops iterating, so it converges. So alpha here I would use is to sort of pick a model that has the like, sort of most well-formedness. So I can use alpha to compare, you know, a three-topic model to a four-topic to a five-topic, or I can here use it against different mathematical structures. Remember, this is not a measure of how many topics there are. This is the measure of like how kind of silhouette style, like how, except silhouette higher is better, um, how much the topics kind of are separate from each other. So this is a pretty good number, okay? And these two are not. Um, so these are, the fit model is much more well-formed, so to speak. I can also get my entropy values because the correlated topics model doesn't give me an alpha for some reason, but entropy, remember, is a similar type of measure of alpha here. It's kind of a measure of randomness, so lower is better. And even though they had the same alpha, the fit model and the Gibbs model have different entropies. So I think, you know, here being the same alpha is kind of just because. Um, whereas here you can see that they're, pretty, they're a little different. And so I can calculate entropy and pick the model with the lowest number because okay. randomness is bad in this scenario. And so this is one reason why people like the fit models. Okay, they tend to produce um, topics that make more sense and these, mo um, these fits that sort of suggest more coherent, clear pictures. Now, I can't guarantee that you'll understand the output from the model but it seems to think that probabilistically these are more clear. So let's look. The topic matrix will give you sort of for each document, here's the rank order of the topic. So it's not the gamma matrix, it's just the matrix of like what's the most probable topics in order. So if we estimated five topics, we could essentially end up with something like five, three, one, two, four which indicates that whatever the fifth topic is, it's covered the most in that document, followed by the third, the first, and then finally the fourth. But the gamma matrix will actually give us the actual probability of each one. So it might be that the fifth topic is 99% probable, or it might be 22% probable. So it really just depends on um, the likelihood of that document, but it's ranked first. So this is like a rank order. That matrix is really useful for just classification. If you just want to say pull 
the most probable topic from each one, bam, here's our classification, this is what you'd use. And so here's how you do that. In R, you just do topics, and you say, here's my pitted model, and here's K. So you have three topics, first one is the most likely third, and then two and then one, and then third, and then one and then two, etc. I can compare that to another model that gives, so you can see as I switch back and forth that they are different. So they gave us different answers. And it might be that topic two and one, um, one, two, and three is very different across these two models. The other thing I can do is get the most frequent terms or the most probable terms for each one, which is not just frequent. I mean, it's frequent in the sense of probability, I guess, but like these are what those topics represent. Um, the beta matrix will tell us the weights for those. So this matrix or this output here really doesn't tell me if bike is way more than success or if it's equal to success. But as an interpretation here, what I can think about is what's happening in our topics. Okay. So this first one here is a lot of the definition of attention. The second one here is more about the, the explanations of the experiments that we talked about in class. And this third one here is mostly about the invisible gorilla study. So I can, like, because I wrote these questions, I can kind of see like this is them defining attention, this is them talking about the experiments, and this is them talking about specifically about this one study that people found really fascinating. Because the gorilla is on a bike. I can do that same thing for a slightly different model, but this one to me does not fit as well. So I can kind of still see the bike gorilla thing here, but gorilla is actually in this other one. I don't get quite as clear of a picture. Like this one would be harder for me to interpret. And you can do more than 10. So the number out here is the number of terms to show. Sorry. Here. I just picked the top 10 because it's easy. Now this I totally stole from Julia Stills, but I can make a, using tidy text, make a, um, a pretty GG facet plot out of this. And so I pull out that beta matrix and then I group them by topic, pick the top 10, uh, and then arrange them in descending order. And then I, uh, you can also use theme classic or theme BW um, as a sort of default ggplot theme, but I like having more control. So I've written at some point like the really nice like function that clears this up and makes it look like a journal plot to me and then I can increase the text size. Uh, but Theme Classic actually does a lot of this as well. It gets rid of a lot of that gray background nonsense that they had for a long time. Okay. Uh, and then, so what am I doing here? I'm taking my top terms. Okay, I'm doing a little bit of mutating. I'm just ordering them. Okay. Uh, throwing that into a ggplot where our x-axis is the term, although it's on y right now, so we'll that in a second. X-axis is the term, y-axis is beta, and we're just coloring them. Okay, so we're making bars for the betas. Um, G on bar, the stat here is identity. That just fills it in for the number, so I'm not calculating a mean or anything. So these bars represent beta itself. Okay. Facet ref breaks these into each topic separately. Cleanup clears up the gray backgrounds except the top here. Chord flip turns this on its side. I love chord flip. Um, so what we end up with is this kind of nice pretty picture of those topics now with weight. And the only other thing I would change about this is I would put them all on the same scale. Okay. So see how it's 0 to 10, 0 or 0 0.10, 0 to 0.08, 0 to 15. So I would actually make them all the same so they're a bit more comparable. But what we see is this first topic is really the word top, so top down attention. This next one is observe elements pretty heavily. Okay. Um, then a little bit of a little bit of gorilla, but uh, observe the elements on the screen. Okay. And this last one is mostly bike, and then the word mean. Okay. So 
this gives me a better feel for um, how much weight each word carries in that topic. All right, so I can figure out the least to most likely topic. Uh, and that matrix is created from gamma, and I just like more information rather than less. And I really think having the probability of each topic is a useful number, because um, then I can tell better if these topics, if these documents are clearly one thing, or if they're actually kind of a mix. So let's say I have five topics, and um, a document is, you know, 60% topic five and then, you know, sort of 10% of everything else, that's got a clear winner. But let's say it's topic five, but it's like 25% topic five, 20% topic two, and, you know, another 20 and 20 or something. Um, then it's not really clear which one it should go into. It's actually a mix of different things. The raw topics matrix doesn't tell me that. It just tells me which one won. So I like gamma because it's like it tells me a little bit more information about the likelihood of each topic. Okay, so don't lose that information, but we're going to just kind of make a quick, there are lots of ways to visualize this, um, but I think this plot um, kind of nicely just gives me a broad picture of many documents at once. So you can grab that gamma matrix and then go to town, doing whatever you want to do, but a simple plot is to just like Throw them up there like it's a scatter plot. Okay. What does that tell me? Well, what it does is it ranges from 0 to 1. Right? This is a probability distribution. It tells me each topic across the bottom here. I think I have it. Yeah, it's still kind of big. I'm going to zoom out. Okay. So the main idea here is this. If things are well formed, meaning they're mostly one topic and not anything else, that means that they're going to hover at 1 and zero. So things that are clearly one topic and not a huge mix are, are um, the gamma distribution represents some scores that are high and then lots of small scores, much like an EFA. Okay. And so with this plot, I can quickly tell that there are clear documents in each topic. So I have an over topic, right? So if I have um, six topics, but one of them is never really super probable, then I probably have too many topics. Okay. So clearly I have things that are like, clearly that topic and clearly not anything else. Okay. And then I have a lot of them that are sort of, again, zero. So the, the more they separate, the more you have these kind of clear topic assignments. And the more things that are kind of here in the middle or completely you know, solid rows of dots, the more messy it is. Okay. So we have a couple of documents. I use seven five as my cutoff, right? So everything here in the middle, a couple of documents that are kind of a mix. Okay. But most of them are like one, two, or three. Okay. Um, so there are other things you can do with that matrix, right? Um, you can mix that a little bit with the probability, the, the beta weight matrices. Uh, but this to me just gives me a quick view are things separate or are they very messy? And that's the, that is a representation visually of alpha. They're pretty separate, so alpha was pretty low. All right, so that's really what I would do with the, the topics package in R. And the chapter that Julia Silge has us in her, on her free online book, Tidy Text Mining in R, is so great. And it gives you more examples, so I would um, I'd recommend reading that. It's really cool. Um, and then I took this idea of a Gutenberg R kind of from her Jane Austen examples. <laughs> so um, thank you, Julia. Uh, to do this in Python, we're going to go back to Jensen. So last week we used Jensen, and we used the LSI pack, uh, function, and we're able to kind of create LSA models, but I told you that like it's not like a lot of the functionality that Jensen has written is like designed for topics model, but then applied to LSA, which to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but otherwise, I love this package. So let's um, take that same basic setup and look at LDA now. It's a little bigger. Okay. Uh, we can use the simple preprocess function in Jensen. 
but I'm going to show you a bigger, more expanded function now. And then there's this really great tutorial on how to use Gensum that um, I took some of this from. All right. The other cool thing we're going to use is this PyLDA Viz. Okay, this is a package in Python that our library in Python that allows us to create these really cool visualizations of our LDA model. And I will show you a thing in a minute. Uh, if you're on a Windows machine, be sure you do X or it will run forever, maybe crash your computer. <laughs> so we're going to load all that up. And then it's giving me some nonsense here. I haven't rerun this in a little bit, so it gave me some of these like cranky warnings. Okay, import gems in this corpora. Corpora. We used that function last week, and then some NLTK to build ourselves a pre-processing function. So I move my answers from R to Python, just like we did last week, and then I built. Um, Oh, I didn't use apply here, but that's okay. So I built myself an empty spot to save that process text. Okay. And then I just loop through. I think this is pretty much what we did last week too. Except I don't remove punctuation. And I think that's one thing that um, Sean sent was an example of like a quick way to remove punctuation, which you can do with regular expressions, which I'm, um, I'm going to email you guys after class. Right. And so um, we're going to lowercase everything. We're going to create some tokens because we're going to take out those stop words. We're going to stem them because we stemmed our, our other example. And stick it all back together. Okay. Now, in the topics package in R, it allowed us easily to remove numbers and low um, words with only so many characters. And we can also do that here in Python. Um, but this gets us the same basic picture minus that punctuation. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. So I didn't remove it in this example on purpose. Okay. Um, because I want to show you what happens when you leave punctuation in and it's not pretty. All right. So then it's, it's a, since it's Gensum, it's the same setup. So we're going to use Gensum multiple times this semester. And I just really want you to see that it's super nice to have these all in the same package because the setup is very similar to get it into the right structure. So one reason why I kind of use this package is because this um, LSA topics and word to vec all have kind of similar structures. So we're going to build ourselves that corpus out of our process text. Okay. So for this you put in a list of tokens, a list of a list of tokens. Okay. So like each row is a list of tokens. We're creating a document by term matrix by using dictionary, which we just built up here. Doc to bow okay, for each of our documents in our process text. So loop over, create this um, documents by terms matrix. And the whole weighting scheme that we did earlier is built in to Jensen. Okay, so you don't have to kind of calculate it and then run it. We just like do it straight in Jensen. So we put in our document by term matrix. I'm so used to calling them TDMs, um, but this is actually documents by terms. It's okay. Um, you can call it either way. It's a matrix of terms by documents. Uh, I put in my, um, when it builds these models, it creates the column names essentially as a key, as a, as a number. And so we tell it what numbers refer to what words. Uh, put in our number of topics. Our sort of random state, a random start. It can be 42 if you wanted, or 100, or 2020, 2010. This is that set seed stuff. Update every token. Chunk size here is sort of an interesting piece. Um, I always just set it to something kind of large. Okay. Uh, I have not played with that um, parameter that much, uh, but it's essentially like how many parts to take at once passes so it goes through multiple times here's our alpha equals auto okay. um, so this brain fart <laughs> Woo, some brains like in and out uh, this is our LDA fit model okay and not a fixed model we could set this to fixed and when we say per word topics equals true okay. 
Now, I think there's some other pieces in here. Let's just look. Jimson topics models. Because, um, oh, I gotta find his, his website. Here we go. The uh, documentation of this package is wonderful, right? So we could weight our matrix and pull out some of the, the top and the bottom. So this is one reason why we're not going to get the same answer. Um, and it gives you some uh, examples of different types of things that you can do. And I think I felt like it has um, prior belief. Decay, and an offset, iteration, gamma threshold, uh, minimum probability. Here we go. Oh, wait, topics with a probability lower. So, minimum probability would allow you to get rid of too many topics. I'm trying to see if it had no. So, it doesn't seem to have the option to eliminate low frequency words. So you would have to do that on your own. I thought it did, but I think I'm thinking of, um... oh no, here it is. Sorry, I can't read. So minimum um, B, I guess, B value is the uh, lower bound of the term probability. So this is where we could, we could put in that number like we had before. So we could change that to 0.1 and get a similar answer. Okay. So um, let me add. So we're going to get pretty different answers from R here to Python, but that's because we've manipulated several of the parameters, right? So in the R version, we've eliminated some of these low frequency terms, and we've also eliminated punctuation. <laughs> and then in the topics model in Python, we haven't done either of those. So to get them to be exactly the same, I would need to do that. Because mathematically, otherwise, they are the same by using auto here for an LDA fit model. All right, so how do I view this? Well, functionality-wise, I, I like Jensen, but it just kind of gives you a matrix back and it's like, play by yourself. So the topics model package has a little bit more visualization and pulling things out, um, but I can print topics. We looked at this last week. And unfortunately, the first thing that comes up is a period and then attention, okay, comma, change, process. So it's actually not that different. Um, but I really wanted to show you this add-on because the add-on to me is where it's super cool. Okay. So what we do is we prepare. So ldaviz.gensum.prepare. Okay. You put in the name of the model, LDA model. You put in the document term matrix and the dictionary because you have to have both. And then if you're on a Windows machine or the server, make sure you are using this in jobs equals one. Okay. If you leave that off, it may run forever. Okay. I've, I have done this before where it has crashed on the server because um, it's trying to run too many jobs or threads or whatever you want to call it at once. Okay. So on my Mac, it runs fine without this, but on a Windows machine, this is necessary. Because <laughs> otherwise, unless you just have like a brand new fancy machine, it can cause you computer problems. Because okay. it essentially doesn't know how to like uh, from what I read in the documentation, it doesn't know how to um, assign the task, basically, and so it just kind of freaks the computer out. It's a short version of that. Okay. And so from that, we do dot save HTML, and we save our visualization. You can call it whatever you want. Okay. And that'll save you an HTML file, okay, which I have open here. Okay. So we kind of get three nice separate topics. This casts this into a 2D space. And so what you want to look for on this left-hand side here is it will tell you the um, the sort of R-squared value, essentially, um, which is good because now I have a, a measure of, like, how good the topic is, so to speak. So if they overlap a lot, they're probably the same topic. And if they're really, really tiny, there's probably topics there that you don't need, so you should limit, lower the number of topics in your model. And you can look at their overlap. So this is when we talked about having a nice clean model by looking at the gamma distribution, which you can totally get out of Jensen. So you can make that same picture by taking out the, Jensen, the gamma distribution and creating the nice dot plot. Okay, but this to me 
shows me that. Look at that. They're pretty separate. Okay. Um, and then when I click on each one, this is not beta across here. I'm going to ignore this relevance metric because as much as I have read this paper and I didn't like fully like have a good way to explain what they're doing. Um, but this is an option where you can change the sort of relevance and what it does is it changes the, um, the kind of the way it calculates which one is the most relevant. But let's say we just leave that as sort of default neutral. What you get is sort of the, the, the token frequency and then kind of its weight given its token frequency. So it's not beta, but it's kind of a represent, representation of that. So like given how frequent this word is, here's how much it's related to that topic in descending order. So it kind of puts these in. So it's kind of a representation of beta. Um, and it's really tiny, sorry. Uh, but, you know, check it out. Like, look at all this punctuation <laughs> that I should have gotten rid of. So I did that on purpose to show you that punctuation really has n is no good in a topics model. Be sure you take it out. Okay. But otherwise, what do I say? Attention, change, process, inform, blind. So these most frequent weighted words here are the definition of, of attention. Unfortunately, the second topic also gives me those as pretty heavy weights. And then the third topic here, because they're so frequent. And so I would have to go in and grab the beta matrix to get a better picture of, of the strength of each word to the topics. Okay. Um, and so in this case, those words are so frequent that they're sort of like smushing everything else out so to speak. So I should um, get rid of punctuation and then maybe get rid of some of these infrequent words. Right? Never happen. And uh, see kind of how it settles better. Because clearly it does. Um, we saw in the, the R version. Right? All right. So I just love this. I think it's just a super great way to visualize this that doesn't require me to remember anything about Matplotlib. <laughs> so there's my real, my real crux of this, right, is that I'm good at ggplot, but not matplotlib. I just think it's cool, too. So let's do a summary, okay? So we looked at, like, what is topics? Like, here's the theoretical background for a topics model and how that's different from LSA and these sort of other vector space models. So we're going to do one more vector space model next week before we move into neural net models. And um, so we'll do a network analysis which is sort of a vector space and sort of not. So we'll talk about how those are different. Um, so we talked about topics models and it kind of shows you like a variety of different settings. Um, if I was to tell you to pick one thing, that one thing would be an LDA fit model. I personally would do these in R, although I have used Gensum to do them in, in build um, topics by dimensions matrix to use in a machine learning algorithm. So I've done them both ways, but when I'm trying to just kind of give me a picture of the data, I use the, the, the topics model package in R because it, um, it has some cool functions. Right? And then we talked about all the output. Um, I think gamma and beta are the most interesting pieces to me to help me understand documents by topics and words by topics. And we can make an extension into classification and clustering. So I could take my matrices and put them into a cluster analysis, could take my matrices and put them into an EFA, right? So double reduction of the data. Um, or I can use the, the probability matrix for, um, for a machine learning algorithm, like a supervised classification, right? if I knew the answer. So what we did on a project, it did not work, but what we did on a project was we took um, that documents by topics matrix and looked at if we could use the topics probabilities to predict actual category. Uh, short answer was no, not very well. I was kind of surprised. Um, but we used high dimensional space. So I think topics models work better in low dimensional space, so smaller number of topics. 